<laughs> Hi, welcome. How you doing? Very, very well. How are you? I'm great, thank you. All right, so everybody, welcome. This is the fabulous Helen Molesworth. And um, it's not such a hidden secret that when I first started looking at Helen's work, I was secretly or not so secretly hoping that like Madonna, she'd made up the accent and she was really from a small town in the US. That did not turn out to be true. She's actually even more impressive than she seems. And today we're just gonna unpack, you know, how do you become the chosen one who gets handed royal jewelry to appraise? Where do you start? How do you think about it? Basically, what is it like to be the fabulous Helen Molesworth? Now, given that she actually does have this posh accent and it can be intimidating, we decided to make today kind of fun. So every time we say the word provenance, which sounds annoying and potentially pretentious, depending on your time zone and depending on your tolerance, please feel free to take a sip or a shot. Um, Cheers, guys. Cheers. Uh, Cheers. Helen, I'm actually having a G&T in honor of your home of origin. Actually, not home of origin, right? You were not born in England, correct? Born in East Africa. Although, having said that, everybody drank it because it was supposed to have good quinine property. So it's anti-malarial. So it's a it's very true. good drink. And I'm on the local Swiss wine. So <laughs> I'm doing a little stuff here, too. <laughs> All right. So, Helen, let's get right into it. Before we turn to our first royal piece, I think it's really interesting to start with how did you actually end up? You start with Sotheby's and then Christie's. Can you just tell us a little bit about your education and path to ending up inside an auction house before we figure out how you become the chosen one on Royal Jewels? I mean, you've, you've picked me up big time. Um, so I really appreciate it, Sharon. But I was very lucky, I'll be absolutely honest with you. I had a great education. And a lot of it goes back to what your CV is gonna say when you apply to an auction house. And um, I studied classics at Oxford. So I studied Latin and Greek at one of the best universities in the world and wasn't I lucky, basically, and decided after finishing my degree that I hadn't really thought about a career and I'd better work out what I was going to do. Um, and at university, I had studied and specialised in the minor arts and theology, which, I mean, I, I read Latin and Greek. I read the whole of the Iliad in the original. I read the role of the Aeneid in the original Latin. Um, but I specialised in carved gemstones as part of the archaeology. And I carried on digging in Pompeii for years too. And um, I ended up loving these very small gemstones. But I thought, well, it's not very commercial, is it? So what could I do that could be a career? And um, decided to give myself a year trying big jewellery in London. Um, the fun answer to that, which also had a huge impact, was me coming home from university and saying to my parents, what am I going to do now? I don't know what to do next. And my father saying, well, what do you want? And I said, I just want to be happy, like John said at the moment. And he said, right, in that case, choose one, hair, makeup, clothes, or jewelry. Pick one and go and do it. <laughs> and I picked jewelry, and it was the best decision of my life, frankly. Love. Um, mm. You're getting lots and lots of hellos. Hello, everybody. For everyone watching, please feel oh, free. Potentate's there. Please feel free to put questions in the question box, or you can just type in as we go. I'm going to be manning most of the photographs, so you should have room to actually put your comments in for Helen. Um, so Helen, why don't we get started? So one of the very biggest ones that you are, of course, really known for is the auction of Princess Margaret's jewels. And I believe this is 2006, so you were approximately 12 years old at the time. <laughs> I'll go and, with that. Thank you. Um, Let's start with actually the catalog cover. So why don't I go, oopsie, sorry. Why don't I go here? Oh. So at the time, this one is Christie's or Sotheby's, Helen? This was now Christie's. So I Christie's. Okay, so how did you end up at Christie's? How did you get there? And uh, we'll get into how did you end up being the one? Well, initially I got into Sotheby's on the graduate training scheme. So I was very lucky that out of, sort of 2,000 applications, they took six of us to fast track us. And I'd started studying gemology and I was already in the trade and I'd really made a clear proof that I wanted to get into the industry. So they, they earmarked me initially for jewelry and sent me out to Geneva straight away. So I'd already done, you know, Geneva Sotheby's and then, um, well, not headhunted, that's not the right word, but moved over to Christie's sort of five years later. To a wonderful team of uh, two other chaps and me with the specialists we all got on like a house on fire and um, I'd been there I think a year or two years 
and a phone call came through from the head of Christie department for me said um Helen there's evaluation you're good at history you're good at research I want you to do it and the next day I turned up with a colleague to Kensington Palace to Princess Margaret's old apartments where we were met by members of the family plus some other very distinguished people who I probably shouldn't name drop and they opened totally named <laughs> well, your provenance Helen provenance hmm? Or I can drink if I keep something secret. Hmm. And um, they opened a bottle of vintage champagne at 11 o'clock in the morning and started pulling tiaras and jewellery out of the safe that the family had either never seen before or not seen for decades. Yeah. And that started. It was a all good at research question, go and, go and start. And yeah. then they put me in charge of the sale at like under the age of 30. It was extraordinary. Did your colleagues, so there's two other jewelry specialists at the time, they must have been so bitter. No, no, it was them that helped me. Absolutely not. Um, my boss at Christie's was way more senior than me and he was absolutely behind it. I think it was partially his idea. Um, uh -huh. No, not, not. We were a wonderful team and they supported me hugely. So I'm seriously grateful to them. So no. you, you became a star in your own right. These are both photographs of you. So maybe you'll tell us what's above and what's below in the images. Sure. Well, so one of the reasons I'm in all the press photographs was because um, I was the only female specialist involved and only three of us were allowed to touch the jewels for press reasons. And of course, I was the only girl. Um, so the top one was just this most beautiful brooch um, that belonged to Princess Margaret. And it was the M brooch. We even used that as a um, model for the stamp that every single piece of jewellery received to prove that it was a Princess Margaret piece. And this was actually made in 1951 for her 21st birthday. So it's really special. That we put an estimate on of three to five thousand. It sold for one hundred and eighty seven thousand pounds. All right. So do you want to jump in now or should we get a little farther ahead with well, teasing estimates? Yeah, we can do that later if you like, because obviously yeah. this one here is the numero uno for the wholesale, the Baltimore tiara, which I think many people have already heard of. And this was, and I think you might show a picture of why everybody knows it later as well. Yeah. It was bought for Princess Mother, there we go, the face <laughs> from the crown. Um, it was bought for her wedding second hand at auction in 1959, five and a half thousand pounds. Um, and of course she was marrying Lord Snowden, who was the famous photographer who put the picture of her in the bath. And this was an extraordinary piece because it was a royal jewel. It became a royal jewel, but was bought at auction secondhand. So, you know, very unusual. It was her personal jewel. So she had her own tiara and it was beautiful because it would catch into lots of different pieces. Um, she obviously wore it at her wedding as a tiara, but here you see her in this fringe necklace. And that was one of the multiple options that it would make. So you could have fringe necklaces, hair pieces, brooches. It was hugely versatile, like the best 19th century pieces of jewellery are. Um, and I got really unstuck. I mean, I obviously love jewellery and I'm super excited. I love these sort of pieces. And I was taking it to pieces with these screwdrivers really excitedly as soon as I got my hands on it when it was back in the office. And I only just got it back together in time for a massive meeting with a really big journalist because I, was, I got to look and see what it does. Yeah. I love so it was, that aid piece and she obviously you know made use of it in all of these different um different ways so this is the result which was uh 926 400 british pounds so that's like 1.2 for us dollars right i think that was about 1.2 1.3 at the time exactly yeah okay so this one i think is a perfect place to start because it wasn't originally royal so when we get to provenance Provenance. Oh, yeah. yeah, ahead of you. <laughs> For those of you joining us, we're trying to make this less um, posh than it really is. So whenever we say the word provenance, depending on your time zone and your tolerance, feel free to have a drink with us. And I just want to say um, hello, Dolians. That's my old school. They're logging in. Oh, well. and oh. I saw you give a talk to them. She really is that posh. She is. <laughs> True. Um, so a few questions here. When this one came up at auction and was purchased by whomever purchased it for Princess Margaret, did you start with the selling?
price to begin the estimate since you had something fairly recent to go by? And then if you're willing, can you just talk a little bit about then what do you do to adjust the estimate now that it has a royal provenance? And she was, she was very you know, famous, well-liked in addition to royal. So uh, where do you start? Okay, so I mean, that's a brilliant question. And it's one that we always ask ourselves when we're doing something like this, because it's, it's a tricky one. There, frankly, there isn't a correct answer until you sell the people. Because it's, an, it's, an, it's a non-fixable answer until the market tells you what they're prepared to pay. Um, this was a very interesting sale because it was basically a fait accompli. Um, the sale was going to go ahead with Christie's. So we were able to we made the decision to price it by what we would price these jewels at without the provenance. And this is very unusual because it wasn't competitive. Wow. So all of the prices in the catalog, you'll see things in there for 50 quid, 150, 500 pounds. Obviously this was in, a, I think we put the Baltimore in 150 to 200,000, which was a good price for a tiara at the time. But this was the price without any added provenance because frankly, how do you add, oh sorry, how do you add <laughs> Two pieces. We're going to go down, Helen. <laughs> yeah. See it off. It'll be, it will be done in a minute. Mm -hmm. But how do you add value of provenance to pieces that belong to the sister of the queen when nothing comparable has ever been sold before? So we basically didn't have a price comparison for the provenance. So we had to. <laughs> so we genuinely had to start with what the jewels were worth. And that's how we fixed the baseline estimates to start the sale. Now, oh, tell, we knew tell, it was going to go above that, obviously. Tell the truth. Did the family have opinions about what the reserve should be? Do you advise them? How does that interaction take place? Because we all know, and you probably shouldn't say it, but I'll say it, we all know the houses price as low as possible to give everyone false hope and to get excited so that everyone participates and that drives up the price to where it ought to be. But the, the auction is actually happening on behalf of the family, right? They are the consigners. So did they ask you, you know, what the, did they have opinions? Did they come to you with the base reserve? How did that work? So again, I'll say this was quite an unusual situation. It wasn't how it normally would be, where there might be a competition for the comp competitive estimates, um, and there might be very strong opinions from the sellers. We were trusted explicitly with the sale. And obviously it was in our interest to get the best price possible to achieve the best results and to get the highest level of press possible because that's going to achieve the best results too. So I don't think at this point we were even pretending. Of course we knew the prices. We, we were setting it low on purpose and everybody knew that. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the very few examples where I think in the auctions, we knew we were doing that. Everybody knew we were doing it. Very transparent. Um, and of course, that was a great way of getting people interested. So it was a great system to get the best results possible. And our responsibility was to the clients, to get them the best prices for their mother's pieces. You know, these were heritage pieces. And they were personal. I really cared because you could see that we worked with members of the family. You wanted to do the best for these people. You always do, you know. Um, so it's, it's a tactic that was very clear and, and it clearly worked. I love her. <laughs> Bath so much. Those of you who I'm, I'm sure everyone watching has watched The Crown, but if you haven't, the episode where they they reenact his photograph in the bath is the best. So please check it out if you haven't. All right, I want us to keep going because, of course, this was a very large sale, and the next one I believe is the Riviere, which sold again for about a million two, a million three U.S. dollars. What did you do with this one? So how do you start? Oh. This isn't, you know. There are lots of rivieres. This is beautiful, but what do you do? This honestly is the piece I remember probably the most strongly as my first reaction because it was pulled out of the safe that Wednesday morning and the box was opened and I remember the family going, oh, there's a note in there and they hadn't really remembered or seen it. And the note said, the lady Mount even. And I remember saying, what does that mean? And everyone was like, no. Oh. Nobody knew. And I just did a bit of research afterwards. Lady Mount Stephen was Queen Mary's lady-in-waiting, and she bequeathed her jewellery collection when she died to Queen Mary. Queen Mary left this to Prince Margaret. So this was just, I mean, I get goosebumps. Wow. Aww. Queen's jewellery. 
princess's jewelry and family jewelry. It doesn't get more exciting, right? And more personal. Um, so of course this had massive royal provenance. Um, with oh, a piece like this, you've... Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna be out of wine in a minute. <laughs> Um, you've got to start with the intrinsic value. This is a simple piece of jewelry. It's a line of diamonds. Diamonds have a uh, fixable price. We can price them against an index and you work out the price of the stones. So that's the starting point with something like this. You know, the antique pieces are harder because you've got to work out what jewelry as a, an object is worth. This is a starter because you start with the diamonds, then you add on, it's got some age, it's got 19th century and then you think about the provenance, but we let that roll. And did you, did you actually give this one a kooky low estimate? Do you remember what it was? I think the low estimate on this one was about 200 to 300,000 pounds. So it was a reasonable estimate at the time, you know, but it made just under a million pounds in the end. I mean, honestly, only, only five times the estimate. Some pieces in this sale made 150 times the estimate. Oh, that's true. Henry North is reminding us you have said the word, so we, we're in for a sip, Helen. Thanks, Henry. I was Henry. Oh. All right. <laughs> Drunken IGTV by the end, ever made. <laughs> and recorded. <laughs> All right, then another big one. So this one I think is nice and challenging. So by the way, those of you listening, you can ask questions in real time. You don't have to be shy and polite. You are welcome to jump in and ask Helen what was going on at the time. So, it. all right, she wore the pearls a lot. There's loads of photographs like this Cecil Beaton of her in the pearls. And here is someone's hand holding it up. Is it you? I thought it might be you. Always me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how'd you like to be Helen Molesworth? That is nifty, Helen. I'm into it. I know. Rima from Culture of Pearls just gave you a bunch of parts, right? Helen got to play with these. Yay for Helen. Where do you start? So these are natural or cultured? These are natural. So at wow. the time, that's quite a big deal. You know, five rows of really, really well-matched natural pearls. Cool. But we have hit the crazy, crazy natural pearl um, prices that we saw in the next that flowed. So this was already, you know, just a little bit before the big crazy prices. We only put 15 to 20,000 on these, um, which I, I do look back and I think that was actually quite low for what they were at the time. Um, but they made 66,000. So again, it wasn't out of whack with the real value of, this, of the actual gems at the time. Um, but again, this was before the, the, the big crazy natural pearl prices. I mean, I think this is one of the few pieces. Sorry, I got that wrong. It was 276,000. That's it? Yeah, still 276,000 for this. It's wow. not the craziest thing when you think no. five really well, well matched of natural pearls, you know? Were uh, you surprised at all by any of the buyers? Was anyone sort of an out of the blue or an unexpected? Because for those of you listening, when it's a sale this big, Helen, you jump in if you feel like it, but I won't make you. The house pretty well knows who the lead uh, interested parties will be. So did anything surprise you with this one? I mean, not surprise as such, but I can say that there was a lot of, there was a lot of Asian interest because of course, you know, Hong Kong and China loved anything royal. Yeah. So that was quite a, a big portion of the value bought in from the sale. Um, but other than that, it was quite, I remember it being very, very broad. You know, we had people all over the world interested and we took it on, on, the, on, on sort of, touring exhibition all around the world so i had my first trip to hong kong uh, i gave oh. tour and new york and obviously geneva because i was living in london at the time and um, we even sort of traveled around british stately homes and did exhibitions. so and it was really broad really broad how how many months of roadshow did you have so you're going to people's homes who i assume are very well known to the house and likely to be bidders how how many months and mission actually that wasn't so much directed as individuals to make sure people saw these pieces it was much more public exhibition so that everybody would knew it was there would know it was there yeah it was it was almost you know a, a nicer way of doing it for the public oh i think that's fabulous and amazing for you i mean for those of you joining again she's under 30 doing this going around the world with Princess Margaret's jewels if you are of english origin couldn't be more attached to the concept so she's doing something of cultural importance to the country. I will say for provenance, a few people have, Helen, provenance. 
Oh, a yeah. few people have um, asked me about the necklace. This, the necklace and the earrings are Christopher Walling, who knew Princess Margaret. So I decided to go in full theme. He is on the live with us. You are welcome to tell him directly that you like the necklace. It is really great. <laughs> sure, he posted something about giving her some rubies that she wore at dinner. So yeah, exactly. That later. Oh, mm -hmm. wait, did you get the rubies? And I don't know, because I just saw a message from Christopher coming up saying I gave her some rubies that, uh, and I don't know if they were part of that. I don't know. We'll see. Amazing. Well, another one I want to ask you about. This oh, one surprised me, the bee brooch. So will you tell us what the story was? There's a note here as well. Yeah, this was one of the really cute pieces where you remember this was a family like any other family to a certain extent. Um, you know, it wasn't just about diamonds and tiaras. It was about jewelry that somebody wore that was original. And we've all been given jewellery by somebody or inherited it or given it to somebody else. And this was actually um, a confirmation gift to Princess Margaret in 1946 oh. that was given her by Queen Mary. Um, so it had a little note saying, on your confirmation day. And I just thought, you, you could have any grandmother doing that for their granddaughter, couldn't you? You know, it's not necessarily a royal action and it's not necessarily a royal piece of jewellery. It was something that everyone could connect and I love that about the sale. We had some pieces there that you could really just with. Really special. Amazing. Christopher corrects us that she wore the rubies at a dinner he gave rather than he gave her the rubies, but wishes that he had. Um, so this one. And I've, when you're, sorry, my dear. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. When you're estimating a piece like this, which is much more sentimental than actually valuable, but has royal provenance. How did you start with this one? Where do you go? Did you do the same trick of leaving out all royal? We did. We just said, if that were to come in for sale, 500 pounds, that's what it would be worth, you know? What did it go for? Uh, that went for 33,000. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, this wine thing is getting to me. I'm blaming you for this. I'm, it was it's my fault. To the Queen Mother. And then that was left to, to Princess Mother. Wow. So exactly. I'm going down too if it makes you feel better. Cool. <laughs> Stop this. I never drink when I do talk. Oh. You know what? It is more fun. Those of you watching, you're welcome. Can I just get rose brooch? I've got actually the written down what the note said on the video. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll read it out. Of course, we can't really read it. I think it was a note that was written in Princess Margaret's own writing. Wow. That said, almost the first bit of jewelry given to mum. Um, by Venetia James, who was one of her, her friends, and I think maybe the godmother of the Queen Mother at the time. And then it was given to Princess Margaret in 1945. And that's what the note said in her own writing. Uh, now, how much do you think it affects buyers when they have something this personal? Because presumably when we're estimating, you don't put it in your low estimate, but you have something in mind when a piece has additional aspects of a connection to a royal, like a note. So did you feel that this one was likely to go as sky high as it did? You did. Yes, I think so. I mean, there were others that I thought would be proportionally higher. I think we'll probably show some in a minute. Yeah. Uh, this wasn't a beautiful piece of jewelry. You know, it's quite a, an old fashioned look. Yeah. But it's also, it's also very touching. Um, and you can really see the bee. It's a proper 19th century piece of jewelry. Um, so you know that, that note's going to make a huge difference of course it is yeah. and did they offer you the note did you find it was it just randomly in the case how did that one happen cases with the jewels yeah so that was what it was opening the cases where you wouldn't you didn't know if you were going to just find a jewel you might find a handwritten note by somebody in the royal family that was why i you know i said that the Baltimore, the necklace the the riviere necklace was so such a shock it was the first note i think we found I just, I can't. Now, are you wearing gloves? What are you, what are you actually wearing? You're inside the home doing this? No, it's just like a evaluation of somebody's jewelry. So you pick up the pieces and look at them. Fab. Mm -hmm. All right, there's the rose brooch. Tell the us. Brooch. This was made by Cartier in 1938. And um, it was a special piece for one very specific reason. Princess Margaret's middle name was Rose. Oh. And that was made. I'm sure that was the reason it was hers. Um, so lovely. Yeah, her engagement ring, which wasn't sold, they family kept. It was also in the shape of a rose with a ruby in it. 
So these are really, you know, you could see the connection to an individual again. Um, for this piece, it was quite an important um, piece that she was seen wearing to the coronation of her sister at Westminster Abbey. So this was worn to the coronation of the Queen. Okay, so now we have a, a triple threat question. Someone sent in the first two parts. So when a piece like this has both royal provenance and comes from a grand maison, how much- Provenance, sorry. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, whoops. Everyone else, come on in. <laughs> when it has both royal provenance and comes from a grand maison like Cartier, and now you have the third point, which is it's been part of one of the most important historic events ever captured, like a coronation. Thank you, Henry. You've been very supportive. Yeah, I was um, yeah <laughs> Helen, Henry, and I will be on the floor at the end of this. <laughs> um, so where do you start and what do you think is the most important aspect? So if it has all three versus one of the two or two of the three, what do you do? So if this were a piece where you were to put a real value on starting point right ah. um, I think you start with the jewel you have to because that's intrinsically what it is and the one of the lovely things I love about jewelry is that you have an intrinsic value so there's a diamond weight there's a you know creation weight that so you look at basically what's the stone value to start with if it's done a piece by Cartier you then know you're looking at something that's also got the artistic value to add to it so you've got to consider that if it's then a nice 30s piece by Cartier, which has got a massive premium because it's deco, late deco. You've got to then add that on. And I think when you've got to that point where you've taken into everything you can take into account for that jewel as it stands in front of you, that you start to add whatever historic background, not drinking, that you might have behind that particular jewel. <laughs> Helen versus the system. Yeah. Uh, now, my question to you on that would be for this one, where did you start and where did it end up? Do you remember? Uh, I think we put an estimate of 15, 20,000 on, which would have been a very fair estimate for a late deco Cartier brooch. Normal one. Uh, and then this, I think, 10 times, 150 something thousand. Crazy. Were you surprised by this buyer or did you expect this one? No. Uh, I did not on the, on the price wise, no, of course. I mean, even as beautiful piece, a piece of Cartier like this today wouldn't be that crazily far off if it went for sale in Geneva sale, you know? That's absolutely true. So here's another one. We have multiple images of this one, the sapphire brooch. The sapphire. Yeah, this was the one I said earlier. I have others that I really loved. You know, again, it's a pretty little art deco sapphire and diamond brooch. But when we opened the case, the note inside said, to darling Margaret on her confirmation day from her loving granny Mary and dated. Aww. So that was when I got a bit confused with the earlier. But again, you know, you've got no from Queen Mary in the brooch. I mean, it just doesn't get any lovelier or more exciting, does it? So we had one and a half thousand because it was deco brooch. That sold for 66,000. Oh, good. Just a little bit higher. <laughs> now, Daphne um, Lingham, um, Lingan from uh, Christie's New York said during our discussion of the first online auction that they expect something between 20 and 40% higher for a piece that is signed and comes from a, a major maison. So if this had been a plain, unsigned brooch versus Cartier, because this one's not signed, correct? No, not. Mm -mm. Did you have an adjustment on this one when you were estimating it because the maison is missing, even though it has the insane provenance? No, again, as if this had come in as just a normal sapphire diamond art deco brooch, it would have been worse so between one to 2,000. So that was the price that we put on it. I mean, everything was priced as is effectively. Because how would, you, how would you work out what the value of a confirmation present from Queen Mary is going to be on top of that, you know? With Queen Mary's handwriting explaining it, how, how do you price that? It's kind of priceless in a way, right? Now, were you, were you visibly freaking out or were you trying to play it cool? Because I oh, assume you thought... Cool. So cool. To be honest, though, yeah, you say that you. I didn't have time to think about it because we were concentrating very hard. You know, to do a valuation, it's not just oh look at that, it's two grand, or look at that, it's fifty grand. 
you've got to really, and everything is so different. You, you know, as I said, some of these pieces were very small and personal. Some of them were big. It wasn't a valuation where you quite often see somebody's got a collection of. It wasn't as if we had a whole series of, you know, five to eight grand diamond brooches. It was a matter of constantly having to focus every single time on a new piece and a new valuation piece of knowledge. So I, I don't remember being freaked out I was when I probably turned up, but I remember just concentrating on the job in hand be quite frank that sounds a bit geeky doesn't it but it's it's what i remember i mean oh, she... I, I i have to say it is oh yes you've done it for those of you joining us she said provenance sorry time for a sip <laughs> all right so let's go on that obviously was a historic sale we've got oh. another nifty number here i think this is queen victoria's coronet is that correct it was it is what well, it was yes so this I think probably is one of the most important pieces of jewelry ever made in the Victorian period in Britain, um, because it was made by Prince Albert for uh, Queen Victoria. So I know, does, I mean, can't we all just find a man like that who's gonna make <laughs> Come on. Um, so he designed this for, uh, in the year of their wedding in 1840. And interestingly, we know that it was made by an English jeweler called Joseph Kitchen, and it was sold for 415 pounds, which I just wow. love the price. Um, this was a very interesting piece because it made massive headlines, I think uh, in 2016, because the culture secretary in Britain put an export ban on it to stop it being sold abroad. So it had come basically into the trade and it was going to be sold, I believe, to the Far East, and the price that everybody knew it was being sold for was five million. So what happens is if there's a very important cultural object that relates to the British nation, the culture secretary can say, this is too important for us to let it go. You can't sell it abroad, but we have to find a buyer within Britain to match that price to keep it for the nation. So five million pounds had to be found to match it, to keep it in Britain. And that was brilliantly done by great support of the Victorian Albert Museum, the Bollinger family who have sponsored the whole gallery, which is stunning there. And it was kept safe for the Victorian Albert Museum, where it is now. And now it's made by Albert for Victoria, now in the Victorian Albert Museum. I mean, hooray, right? So how did this work? Was it already, the sale to the Far East was already in process, the auction house was committed, and then the government no. is out and says, nope? So no auction house in this one. This was not involved in an auction house. Um, with by, an, uh, by auction, it was a private sale that was being negotiated from, I believe, the, the dealer wow. to a person. Um, and I had quite a bit of insight into this piece because I already knew it. Um, oh. I think I should tell you the story about how I came to handle it and, and how I knew a bit about it already. Um, so I have great friends at the v and um, I'm obviously very fond of the museum. And sometimes they used to ask me to go and look at pieces. Um, because I had a lot of commercial experience and handled a lot of jewellery. And uh, every now and again, I would go and look at a few things and we would talk over. And and also, because I've had such an experience with working with coloured gemstones at such a high level over the last 10 years, um, I know a lot about the origins and and I can look at the, uh, the, the potential background for where the gems come from. So I was left to, to look at this for half an hour on my own. And... Um, you know, I could see that some of the sapphires were probably Sri Lankan, other ones maybe not, other ones might have come from other places. And what uh, was very interesting was that I had actually had a knowledge of this piece before, because quite by chance I was in a country house, I knew the owners, and I saw the lady of the house wearing this in a photograph on the piano. Oh, and I out. her and saying, and she just looked down and away, and I knew they didn't more so it had already been sold out of the family <laughs> helen the your your friends from old bristolian said that right now on the screen <laughs> you're wearing the coronet oh somebody this. get a good screenshot of this for helen because given how posh she actually is if you missed that fabulously <laughs> sort of you know behind the scenes name drop helen knew someone who wore it with a photo on the piano because helen is fancy let's let's have actually a toast to helen's provenance <laughs> with the yeah. I love it. All That's right, very so 
Do people well, actually at this point when you're evaluating the coronet and you know that the government is jumping in, do they know that Helen Molesworth is the expert and they're reaching out uh, to you? Oh, I should clarify this one. At this point, I wasn't the expert. This was just where I was very lucky after everything had gone through, all of the pro sale, stopping of sale, new sale. I was just asked once it was in the V&A Museum, I was allowed to come and look at it. You know, that, <laughs> they, if you haven't seen it yet, you really, you, you should get to see it. So I'm not going to take any credit for any parts of the uh, process of how this got to be saved for the nation. That was very much down to the <laughs> Um, Emmanuel Tarpin is on this call and obviously has fabulous taste and would know and says this one's wonderful. And Margot says that Tiara suits you. I so would like I, to know, as soon as Emmanuel's piece start entering royal collections. That's, uh, I can't, it won't be long. If it I'm also available for those pieces, Emmanuel, welcome. <laughs> um, we have a bunch of questions. So somebody, uh, Nina is asking, have you ever handled a piece and it broke or was very fragile? So oh, oh, you're oh. obviously handling something that can't be replaced, really. Have you ever dropped it? Have you ever bungled it? Asking me this because I can't lie. I hate you for asking me this. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell you one of the reasons that I stayed in the jewelry department. When I was at Sotheby's on the graduate training team, I um, moved around different departments and I fell in love with ceramics and glass and, and porcelain, right? Surprisingly. And I used to have to run up and down the stairs to get pieces from the front desk to show the experts to let them do the valuation to save time. And one day going back with a piece, I dropped a Viennese coffee can and it rolled down the stairs like one step after another, slow motion. I remember standing there just watching it like it was a year of life. And nothing was broken, nothing. And that was the moment I was like, I'm sticking to diamonds. <laughs> within, within six months, I had been posted to Geneva to work on the Magnificent Jewel Sales. And we were working, I worked very late hours. I did, you know, I put the hours in. And one night I was working on a 1940s Cartier Citrine and Diamond brooch on my own late in the office that it was about to go off on an exhibition. And I can remember dropping it on the floor and I put it in the safe and came back to the office the next day and I didn't sleep that night. I, I just remember thinking, I didn't check properly, is it? And I came into the office in tears. I thought I was going to lose my job. I'd broken it. I'd broken one of the pieces of citrine it needed recutting. And my boss at the time said, we've all done it. You know, don't crucify yourself. Everyone's done it. But I tell you what, you do it once. <laughs> you do it once. <laughs> Horrible. Learn lessons when you're young. Again, I was 23 when that happened. So you learn your lessons. <laughs> I can't. And the idea that you're 23 and you're handling all these pieces. Now, tell, tell the viewers the truth, Helen. Have you ever put the tiaras on when you're evaluating them? I know that you know the answer to this, and I know you love the answer. I it's love my, so much. It was, it was my secret favorite thing to do until I admitted it relatively recently. So I've blown that cover hugely. Um, when I was a junior cataloger in London, um, you have quite a a boring job some days because it's all condition reports and you're looking at all of the stones counting diamonds counting diamonds doing weights and you're not you, you it's really repetitive and i used to get really quite sort of bored frankly and i discovered that i could go into the safe and pick out a tiara and just put it on my head and sit at my desk with a tiara and just do the work nobody cared until the time i got called to the front desk to see a client and I forgot because it was this beautifully light delicate belle epoque platinum diamond thing and i walked out myself as Helen and the client said Princess Helen I presume <laughs> and after that I was like <laughs> better stop doing this <laughs> literally my favorite Helen story <laughs> all right let's do um, another royal piece that people may not be as familiar with and yeah. in the in the previous photo this is you holding it yes let's and focus on this be in the Daily Mail it was exactly the same week as the Princess Margaret sale. I, I look back at that week. I actually, I got the catalogue out. Pieces from Catherine the Great, from the uh, other members of the Russian royal family. Um, this, it was the biggest royal year of ever of jewellery sales, I think. And this wow. piece was one of the um, pieces in the main jewellery sale after, after we did the Margaret sale. I got a call um, a few months previously from a metal detectorist in the north of England. Um, who said, I've got this ring, it's a diamond, it belonged to uh, the Black Prince, it's really, really valuable. 
And he'd already declared it as treasure trove, uh, who had said it was maybe worth 15, 20,000 pounds. But he'd gone into this whole story he'd developed himself. It was a, a diamond point cut in what was clearly a medieval ring. Very, very, very important. Only a handful of these that exist. And he'd found it in a field in Northern England. And I remember thinking, hugely important. But he basically annoyed the people in the authorities of Treasure Trove so much, they just lowered the price and just like stop with all these conspiracy theories about where it came from. And it went down 20 to 15, it went up to blah, blah, blah. And in the end, he came to Christie's. And I remember just saying that's at least 30 to 40,000 pounds without even questioning it. And it had these two beautiful engraved initials on the side of the ring. You can't see them here, but on the side of the face that way. The initial V and A. And he had this massive theory that they belonged to warring fractions of different, you know, sort of um, royal houses in, under the, the Prince of Wales. But he wasn't that far off because I discovered that there was actually a very strong supporter of Edward III called Van Arteveld. And they shared godparents with their own children. So Edward III's children were godparents, godchildren to him and vice versa. And this ring had three E's in the back. Ah. Edward III, I don't know what it is. So I put this whole theory together that, you know, possibly this could be, a, and it also said loyalty sans fin, so loyalty without end. The British Museum argued it was a love ring and that it was the initials of two lovers, V and A. Loyalty without end? Three E's? They turned up to the sale with lawyers. I thought we were going to have it pulled at the last minute. And in the end, it was sold for £84,000. And my theory was accepted in books that were published later. I'm so dead. It was quite a big deal, yeah. Page three and of the day. Anyone who's in that's not a cool thing. <laughs> 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 All right, here's another fun one. So let's do Fabergé. And this one, I started the, the post with your story by asking, what would you do if someone handed you this to appraise? So please tell us. Well, I don't... <laughs> First off, put it on my head. That's the very first thing I do. <laughs> because you've obviously got to understand how a jewel works and whether it's going to work as a genome. Uh, anyway, um, this one was uh, called the Empress Josephine Tiara because the Briolette diamonds were apparently a gift from Tsar Alexander I of Russia to the Empress Josephine. So after she divorced Napoleon, he used to come and visit her at the Almazon and give her presents, including that little bag of these diamonds. Um, and they were then inherited by uh, her son, Eugène. He, became, he was the Duke of Leuchtenberg. So this was known as the Leuchtenberg Tiara. That was the background to it. Um, and it got sold, I think, after the war to the Belgians. And then it became owned by Princess uh, Queen Maria Jose of Belgium. So that was the, the sort of the, the prov provenance on it. Ah. <clears throat> anyway, um, this one's quite an interesting story because it goes very much to the root of how do you value a piece like this? And I wasn't responsible for this piece of jewelry by any means. I was in Geneva at the time, it was sold in London, but it came through Geneva and we looked at it. And I can remember being very shocked at the time when my boss did the diamond weight on it and refused to pay the price. So it was $400,000 and that was it. He said, that's it. And I can remember my absolute gut going a million dollars. I'm like, this is a million dollars. It's obviously, I'm not even thinking it's a million dollars. And that was when I really learned that women have a very good affinity to these jewels. Whereas some men tend to use calculators, we use our hearts. And I did realize that when these situations happen to me with male specialists and me, I would generally be right. But a great starting point, $400,000. Anyway, it went in at £400,000 in the end, which was about half a million dollars. And um, what did it sell for? I think it sold for over a million pounds in the end. So $1.35 million in the end. Wackadoodle. So people will start with the diamond weight and some people will just end it there. But you can't when it's Fabergé. It's got real provenance and it's a unique piece. And we didn't say that this is Fabergé. A Fabergé, Fabergé tiara is a really big deal. You know, a really, made by one, one of the best workmen of the Fabish workshops. Dead. Absolutely dead. All right, you know, word and word. I, I get, this is potentially very dead. <laughs> <laughs> In vino veritas. Enjoy. Good, very good. I like that. 
Um, this one, any of you following the Instagram account will know because I love doing my little uh, tiara pieces. And this is a, a picture of two tiaras that I just find so similar that I had to put together. And also because I have a feeling I handled one of these in London in my early days, in my early 20s, and I didn't know at the time. Wow. And this really I wanted to talk about because, you know, talking about how you price things and value. One of these two pieces I was handed when I walked into a dealer's um, office in Hatton Garden. And he was just like letting me play. It was fun. He was just like, try this on. And he said, what do you think of that breaker? And this was a really good reminder that tiaras, until relatively recently, had very little uh, historical art value. And breakers were pieces that people bought for the stone. They shattered into pieces to sell the stones off. And it's one of the reasons that now tiaras have become so much more valuable, because they're so much rarer. Because so many of them over the last 50 years were bust up. Yeah. Um, thankfully, whichever of those two it was, I have a feeling it was the top one, which is now known as the Barberini tiara, uh, were not, was not broken up, it survived. But this concept of, of breakers as tiara, it makes you realize that rarity is not recognized until certain points in a lifetime of a type of jewel. And we will see these changes always continue. Mm. Catherine the Great? Handled quite a few Russian jewels, I must admit, I'd be very lucky. Um, this was one that was a little, yes, exactly. This one actually was one that I catalogued directly. So the amethyst ear pendants were, um, there were two pieces that came in from Catherine the Great. And actually when I mentioned the Princess Margaret week of the sales, the same one as the medieval yeah. ring. That's this week too? That's no, this was Geneva several years later, but I'd completely forgotten that there were also two pieces um, from Catherine the Great in this sale. They were two of the brooches that came out of the royal, uh, out of the, the, the collection. Um, I'm just wondering if I could find them to show you. I'm probably not nah, able to. Nah. But two of, the, two of the flower brooches that are quite famously um, parts of these Russian collections. They made sort of tens, 20 brooches at the time. And these earrings, amethyst earrings, probably Siberian amethyst, because of course it was Russia, were part of her collection. Um, but the previous one, the emeralds, this was a really important piece that uh, came up for sale in just May last year um, through Sotheby's Geneva. So I got to play with that. Um, look at it and that was in uh, two million and sold for 4.3 but the history behind this was really cool because it was initially a hundred carat step cut that was owned by Catherine the Great then it was descended down to the Grand Duchess Vladimir and this is the famous Vladimir uh, Grand Duchess Vladimir who had the Vladimir pearl tiara that's now in the credentials because that was then sold to Queen Mary who we've mentioned several times um, and this one was one of the pieces that was probably stashed away in the Vladimir Palace after the Vladimirs did a runner to try to escape at the very end of the revolution and was rescued by an English officer who dressed up as a workman and turned up and rescued the pieces in plastic bags. And that was the step cut that was originally the prince, the great piece. Then that was, it got out safely. It ended up being sold in the 20s recut to this 75 character shape. Oh, is that all? 75? Or earlier, um, IGTV, someone talked about this. It might have been Christopher, I think. Someone mentioned it. Yeah. He's, he's jumped in that Siberian amethysts are the very best. All right. Let's do her. <laughs> so basically, two big names. You're going to go with Catherine the Great and Marie Antoinette. They're the two. I didn't say provenance. Ah. <laughs> you just did. <laughs> Cheating. That's so cheating. <laughs> <laughs> so this probably is one of the most jewels of all time because it was the pearl that belonged to the last Queen of France, Marie Antoinette, um, that came through Sotheby's Geneva from the Bourbon Palmer family. They sold a whole collection of pieces, 10 jewels that belonged to Marie Antoinette through the family. And uh, this was, I think, one of the biggest world records we've seen in recent years. The previous world record for an historic pearl was $10 million for the Peregrina that belonged to Liz Taylor. This sold for $36 million against an estimate of one to two million. And if that doesn't give you an insight to what provenance does to value. <laughs> there we go. I'm dead. 
Amazing. All right. <laughs> and this is see, this is very interesting when you come to think of value sales and people's emotional attachment to jewels. This was another piece that we had in London many years previously with pearls that were supposedly um, belonging to Marie Antoinette. So these pearls were um, supposed to have been given to the wife of the British ambassador in the 18th century as safekeeping because of course during the French Revolution, Marie Antoinette and Louis says were very disliked and ultimately, yeah, exactly. Um, so these were supposed to come through that English family that came down this way. Now the problem was, it wasn't watertight, but this was the family tradition. But I look back on these and the value that the big pearl made, obviously that was a very special pearl. The pearl itself was exceptional. These were still natural pearls, which were an, a nice collection. It didn't sell. It didn't sell at an estimate of £350,000, which was not cheap. But I also wonder about, and it was said at the time, maybe it was the association of people not wanting to have pearls that were worn around the neck that belonged to somebody who lost their life by guillotine. I mean, it um, does feel a little bit uncomfortable. Well, it feels Where wrong. Did you get that wonderful necklace? Literally off of someone else's rolling head. Thank you. No. All right, this is the last one, Helen, because you have so many questions that were sent in. I want to fit as many in as we can. So Archduke, let's do it. So this was a, a, an amazing diamond that came up for sale um, in Christie's Geneva uh, in, what year was this originally? I've forgotten, it was a few years ago, 2012 maybe. Um, and it is still today the world record price per carat for a white diamond. Um, it was... 76 carats, DIF and Golconda. So you've got the perfect diamond specs as a gem, yeah. like yum. And it had a background that it was below, It was owned by Archduke Joseph uh, August of Austria and that it was recorded as being from Hon Hungarian bank vaults by him in 1933. So it was speculative earlier provenance, but we knew that. Yep. Um, and when this came up for sale, it sold... Now, I'm going to give you an idea. At the time, uh, the top DIF diamonds were not going over $200,000 a carat, maybe 180. This sold for $280,000 per carat. So it made over $20 million for this diamond. Wow. You know, we, we had an exact comparison of diamond prices at the time. So this is a perfect example of what's that history adding? I mean, dead. Probably Absolutely dead. Mm. All right, Helen. I have a million questions that I need to put in for you. So uh, you were asked, um, what is your all-time favorite of the royal jewels you personally appraised? Oh, it's, uh, it has to be of royal jewels, does it? Oh, you stinkers. Um, I've got to say Portsmouth Tiara. I mean, to to have had the, the, the honor to have worn a piece of jewelry that was worn by the sister of the Queen of England at her wedding, it doesn't get any better. Um, Fab. Yeah, I've got to say that. That's my favorite by far. How do you suggest dealing with copycats? Have you experienced anything like that in your career? So this is talking more about intellectual uh, copyright, information of knowledge, right? Because nobody uh, knows the things you just shared. You were there. So uh, a viewer is asking, have you ever experienced being copied? How do you deal with it? Sadly, yes, on multiple occasions. Um, I've recently found that several of the pieces of information that I primarily researched and have given in lectures have appeared in some quite well-known recently published gem books. Um, and I know now that the authors were sitting taking notes in my lectures. What can you do? It happened. I should have published first, frankly. Um, and, you know, I've had other examples. I mean, right now I've got a problem where there's a, a whole uh, article that I wrote for the Gemological Association of Great Britain that's been cut and pasted off their website and put on another website of another gem lab. And we can't get it taken down. They're not answering. So, I mean, this is a really uh -huh. thing happened last week and it's just word for word minus my name. So uh -huh. you want to prove because I published it. But yes, it happens all the time. And I even spoke to a friend about this last week. You know, how do you handle this? Because sometimes they're very personal experiences and they're also part of your own uh, knowledge and value set, you know. Mm -hmm. He gave me great advice and he said, you've either got to publish it or keep researching and create new material. Mm -hmm. And that's 
the only actual answer. Um, I personally believe in sharing. I, I, I can't hold information back for reasons. I, I love the subject like you do. We love it. We love it. Mm. Um, can you identify one to two milestones in your career which were instrumental in propelling you forward? Princess Margaret, obviously. I think doing that was just... Uh, the, the, after the sale, I was being approached by documentary series to do stuff on telly. I did things on radio. And then I went back to Geneva. You know, it was an amazing, amazing opportunity. By all means, don't give me credit for having deserved it. It was luck. You know, I was really lucky to be in the right place at the right time with really supportive um, senior members in my at Christie's. Um, also, honestly, just making the decision to become a gemologist, studying, becoming, taking the Gemological Association uh, diploma. That was first time I was like, I'm going to do science and I'm going to study this. And I remember my just going, it's science is cool. It's got blingy sparkly things and I can play with diamonds and still like physics. And that was a revelation. So I would always say education's a big one there. Uh, which sale do you wish you had been part of? That's an easy one. Um, the Elizabeth Taylor auction in New York. I handled all the pieces because they came through Geneva and I was very close to all the people at Christie's sit as well at the time. So I got to play some really cool things. And uh, it then went for sale in New York and it was a black pie evening sale. And it just looked so glamorous. And I think the people there really appreciated it. Love. Um, let's see, did I hit you with all of them? Ah, so um, is it harder to price an unbranded piece with royal provenance or a piece from a grand maison without a royal owner and why? Um, I, I think the answer is it depends entirely on the jewel because I mean, in a way it's almost easier to price the grand maison because you've got comparisons. We can look up what does a 1930s brooch make from Cartier? What does something that's specifically deco make? Um, and we've got these comparatives that we can go to, even if they're not identical. But when you come to talking about provenance for royal jewelry, there are fewer examples. We may have a few pieces of Catherine the Great. We may have a few pieces of Marie Antoinette. But the likelihood of there being a direct comparison is so much smaller. So I would say it's probably the provenance that's harder. <laughs> In our final minute, thank you everyone for joining us and please keep sending in your questions. I'm happy to pass them on to the great Helen Molesworth. It was such a treat. You are amazing. And I'll send you a little packet of aspirin for this one because it's going to feel good later. Karen, I'll say for a moment what you do with jewelry and make it accessible to everyone. Anybody who doesn't love Sharon like I do, get onto her Instagram straight away. She supports us in trade and in the business and we love jewelry and we're both clearly jewelry geeks so thank you for having me it's been a pleasure being with you that's why i got her drunk <laughs> <laughs> and you Great know what day, everyone. thank you for so joining thanks everyone for joining thank you everyone see you soon bye